Thank you for listening to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. Before we get to today's episode, we want to take a quick moment and let you know that CityWorks Expo 8, anticipating 2050 acting today, uh, will be occurring October 4th through 6th in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, We've got some really exciting speakers and some other activities lined up that we're excited about. If you all are interested, please check us out at CityWorksExpo.com. That's CityWorksXPO.com. But now, without further ado, let's get on to today's episode. Please listen carefully. Welcome to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. My name is Brad Stevens, and I'll be your host today. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our guest, Governor Paris Glenn Denning, is the president of Smart Growth America's Leadership Institute and the Governor's Institute on Community Design. Governor Glenn Denning also served as the governor of Maryland from 1995 to 2003, during which time he instituted and launched the first statewide smart growth program in the country. How are you doing today, Governor? Brad, absolutely fine, and pleased to be here. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time today. Your your work f- speaks for itself, but I wonder if you could kind of launch us in by sharing a little bit about how you define the work that you've done and the work that you're doing now. Thank you. Uh, you know, smart growth is one of those terms that means different things to different people. In fact, in some ways, when we started out, it means everything to everyone. Uh, by that, I mean that uh, there were people, uh, probably still are some, who thought of it in a very negative term. Most people think of it very positively, uh, but still have a hard time understanding it. Part of that reason is that it has evolved over the years in a rather dramatic way. Uh, generic uh, definition or approach that we use uh, in Smart Growth America, we say that it's an approach to uh, development that encourages a mix of building types uh, and a mix of uses. Uh, it supports a diverse housing uh, and diverse uh, transportation options and focuses development within existing uh, neighborhoods. Uh, puts a stress on community engagement, uh, and then has special emphasis on walkability, uh, sustainability, uh, and where appropriate uh, transit. One of the main goals as well uh, is the uh, conservation and protection of our open space, forest land, agricultural land, and things of this type. That's that's the large definition where we kind of all started. Uh, but over the years, it has uh, evolved and has given uh, different interpretations of what's going on. And if you like, I'd love to jump into that. Absolutely. Take us in. Well, Brad, what started in a lot of ways, and, and uh, uh, so much of what happens in our life is based on personal experiences, uh, and the same was true for me. Uh, I, uh, I was not born an environmentalist. Uh, I'm not sure they have environmental genes or anything of that type. Uh, but uh, what occurred was I was working my way through college, uh, going to a Florida State University, which is up in the uh, Panhandle area, to Tallahassee. Uh, and I had a, a good job at a machine shop so that every time there was a long uh, weekend or a break, I would go home and, and work and a very good pay. Oily, messy, but a very good pay. Uh, it was an eight hour trip. Uh, I took what back then we would call the back roads because I was uh, didn't want to pay tolls, uh, my limited budget. Uh, and I saw as I went by the edge of the Everglades, uh, and I was there for uh, all three degrees, and so I was there for six years. I saw them widening twice. Uh, one of the roads that runs uh, across the edge of the Everglades, Route 441, and they were intruding into the Everglades itself. Now, I almost instinctively looked at that, saw what was happening, and knew something terrible was going on in terms of the future. Well, subsequently, that's become one of the main routes, and they now have developed 50 to 70 miles out into the Everglades, one subdivision after another, one uh, small shopping center after another. And we have lost uh, the great value in terms of a a water supply, uh, storm absorption areas, and everything else. Ironically, uh, under uh, George uh, uh, W. Bush, they had to come back, his brother was governor at the time, 
and make a commitment of almost $20 billion to try to refurbish port parts of the Everglades that were lost by development. Uh, and so I saw this and I started thinking then about the importance of, of land use. I came to uh, Maryland, started teaching when I got my doctorate uh, at the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, and a few years later, I was fortunate to get elected to a small suburban city there, city of Hyattsville. Beautiful old town, a lot of Victorian homes, and just wonderful place, except for one thing, and that is US-1 ran right through the middle of it. And US-1, from Maine to Florida, uh, in this area was just plain ugly. It was nothing but a bunch of used car lots and, and, and uh, third-rate uh, retail outlets and things of this type. No, I must confess that when I was uh, on the city council there, I did not use the word ugly uh, for the describing their main route, but it was. Uh, and so I started talking to some people about how could we get redevelopment. I mean, after all, the town is only six miles from the nation's capital. I'm not saying from the D.C. boundary. I'm saying actually from the physical presence of the capital. So how could we get some significant redevelopment going here? And after several efforts, uh, finally, a friend of mine who was a developer came to me and said, listen, because I had asked him, would he redevelop an old um, telephone building uh, and make it either, either condominiums or office or whatever, right on US-1? And he told me, he said, it's easier for me to go 20 miles a, a further away, a couple of places like Greenbelt and so on, and buy a farm and build a whole subdivision or a whole new office park or shopping center than it is for me to renovate that one building. And I asked them in some detail why, and then I talked to two or three other uh, developers, investors, and they all gave me exactly the same thing. They said, the, the, the zoning and the building code and everything else is not as set up to encourage reinvestment. You needed special exceptions for everything. They needed setbacks and, and all of this sort of stuff. And so I got to thinking about that. And then a few years later, I was elected county executive in Prince George's County, which, which is a county uh, at the time about 850,000 people. And one of the first things we started doing was changing the building codes and ch changing uh, the planning process so that it actually encouraged, instead of discouraging, investment in older communities. Uh, it worked uh, to some extent, uh, but still uh, had some real problems because a lot of this was also controlled by state law, generally building code, the basics of it, for example, are state law. And so then I ran into the, the, the third thing. I ran for governor, uh, and Maryland is pretty much defined by the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and one of my commitments was to make a major focus to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. Well, when I really got into it my first year, what became clear is that the pollution was was not really that much um, point source, meaning coming from, from sewage treatment plants or factories or whatever. It was mostly the runoff and the silting uh, from development and sprawl and impervious surfaces and all of this sort of stuff. And so it was clear if I, what happened in the water starts on the land, and therefore we had to change the land. And so that then led, all of the stuff came together into my thinking about, uh, let's change the development pattern. Uh, let's make a significant, a different approach. We'll st almost start over. Uh, now, you can't, under Maryland law and constitution, you can't just direct the local governments, this is the way you're gonna build. I mean, we don't have power over zoning and so on. But we do have power over money, uh, and the state budget at the time, the uh, the, the base budget of $22 billion, uh, supported a lot of local activities. So we passed a law, and it was almost entirely based on environmental protection, but the law said each local government had to uh, designate a priority development area, which quickly became known as smart growth areas. Uh, it had to be approved by the state, and there were certain minimums. Uh, this may sound strange, but it had to have an absolute minimum of, of three and a half units per acre. Now, that is not very dense, but what it does, we get away from those two acre sprawl developments everywhere. Uh, and then priority was to be given on all state programs and all state funding to projects inside of that development area. So all of a sudden, when we pay 50% of school costs, 
we're not going to do a school for to accommodate growth for a new subdivision out there. The priority is going to be for a subdivision in here, uh, in the development area. So for the first uh, decade or so, uh, a little bit longer, uh, it was largely about an environmental program. Uh, <coughs> I mean, that became uh, the basis of the formation, for example, of the Office of Smart Growth and the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency. It became the basis for the creation of Smart Growth America. Uh, and so from that environmental start, uh, we moved into what was a, a second stage, and that is uh, that recognition, and this is sad in some ways, but not everyone is motivated by just environmental protection. And if you have five or six priorities that are important to the public, and they're going to make decisions based on those, sadly, in many cases, it's not the environment. And so what we ended up doing, um, sort of moving informally, maybe even a little bit on unbeknownst to us in the sense of a deliberate strategy, was changing the nature of smart growth into much more uh, about, in the sec second stage, about revitalization, investment in existing communities, about bottom line finances, and about economic development. And what became clear was that smart growth is a major economic development tool. Look at the jurisdictions all across the country that are now absolutely booming. And the one thing you'll see in common is a real focus on creating a sense of place with walkability and investment and, and uh, higher densities and things of this type. And so we did some, some research as well. People were not moved uh, in terms of decisions or supporting things simply by smart growth or simply by environment. People were moved when you talked about more jobs, better economic development opportunities, less public expenditures because you're not sprawling outward, and for the business community, less cost for investment because they're building where infrastructure is already there. And that, and that became uh, the dominant for the next 10 years. Uh, a role and purpose and face of smart growth. And now when people talk about smart growth, they immediately start thinking about an area that is totally revitalized and exciting and wonderful things going on and some bad things like gentrification. Uh, in the last couple of years, I think we moved into a third phase in, uh, I could give the name of uh, smart growth uh, uh, 3.0 in some ways, uh, but our um, uh, new uh, CEO, uh, Calvin Gladney, uh, largely came up with that uh, interpretation of smart growth 3.0. But in this case, it's much more um, a focus on place, on walkability, uh, on transit-oriented uh, development where appropriate, uh, but it is also about trying to deal right up front with some of the major challenges facing America, uh, the biggest of which is the growing inequity, uh, the economic uh, inequity that exists in our society and is getting worse and worse in many communities. And so part of our question became, how can we use smart growth to actually reduce the inequity that exists? And so you start thinking about uh, proximity for working people to jobs or the range of affordability of housing, or not needing two or three cars for family because now there's transit available and walkability. Uh, and this is catching on in a major way. It is the toughest portion of it though. And, and when we talk about equity, uh, this is not just about very legitimate a responsibility we have for the poorest among us. This is for hardworking families that could be making forty, fifty, seventy thousand dollars and still not be able to live in their old community because housing prices have become so extensive, and so they're forced to live further out and pay more for transportation to get to the jobs where they used to live. Uh, and so the equity uh, and other challenges, including things like climate change, have now become a driving force because it has taken on its own life in large extent uh, as an economic development tool. Now I know I went on too long, but I, I just get excited about this stuff, and it's it's uh, it's uh, exciting to see what's happening in America. Well, and it's really nice because you've answered about five of my questions during that time, so that was really <laughs> wonderful. And I, I, you know, my I think one of the big questions I have now that you mentioned that is that it, it you know. Part of my background is in sustainable development, and so it really echoes that you know the three 
legs of the stool that we talk about in sustainable development in terms of you have the environmental side, you have the economic side, and then you have the justice side there. And I'm wondering, you know, those are often different languages that you have to use to talk to each of those groups. You know, when you're talking to developers and economic uh, economics people, that may not be the same language you use to talk to environmentalists. And likewise, social justice folks or people that are thinking about equity, that's a different kind of language as well. So kind of how do you make all of that work together and, and build a comprehensive whole while still communicating with all those different groups? Uh, first of all, you're absolutely right about the uh, the different messages and all, and and it is so interesting. I, I remember when we were first uh, starting this, and I went uh, down uh, to uh, New Mexico because uh, I speak all over the country. In fact, all over the world, the same issues are coming up in a big way. We went to New Mexico uh, with uh, Harriet Tregoning, who was my first uh, secretary uh, of uh, Smart Growth, and has uh, taken a significant role in the movement. It's, it's Itself. And uh, we went to uh, the, the statewide chapter of uh, NAOP, the, the uh, uh, office, uh, suburban office park owners, and uh, made our presentation and our, our pitch. And I've got to tell you, there was hostility to us. The questions were hostile. What right do you have to tell us what we should be doing and all? And so we, we, we try to keep it at a discussion level. Well, you know, you are asking the local government and state government to build the roads for you to get there and the water and sewer lines for you to do this and uh, to control the traffic for the employees that come to your office parks and all. And they've said, yes, that's the way it should be. Uh, and it was very interesting. So at that point, I decided that what we really needed to do was to take our uh, three-part message, if you will, and make sure that everyone understood all three parts, put the part that's most important to the audience out front. So if you're talking to a primary environmental advocacy uh, audience, that ought to be the lead in on how crucial this is for the environment. But you should make it clear uh, that there are other aspects of it, including economics and bottom line. We need private capital investment to make this work. Uh, and that's something that a lot of my uh, green friends in many ways forget. Uh, that when you start talking about it, they understand it, but it's not something they're motivated by. And we need to adjust uh, to the uh, environmental justice issue. And so now when we go to business groups, we're much better received because we talk about the bottom line. We talk about, uh, for example, uh, creating a market. Instead of having a shopping center, uh, what happens if you had six stories of, of uh, condominiums or office or, or apartments above that, and you got a built-in market right there? Uh, and then you don't, your parkers reduce a variety of other things. And all of a sudden, it's like lights go on all over the country, uh, and people start understanding that. But we make sure in that context, in that conversation, that they also understand the other uh, two uh, legs of the stool. And that is, it's also about the environment. And it's also about social justice. Uh, on the environment, just as a quick example, a standard approach right now is I talk about what's driving smart growth, why it is changing, and I tell them one of the issues is climate change. And they have to understand the importance of climate change in many ways even to protect their investments. Uh, and they have to understand that when we're talking about the greening of stormwater management, it's not just from an environmental perspective, it is because of the flash floods that are increasingly occurring, because like in Houston, where they had three 500-year flash floods in four years. Uh, and what has happened is they have uh, paved over so much of the natural drainage system and all. And so if you want to protect your investment, I say to business leaders, then work with us on issues of sustainability and green water, uh, stormwater management greening process. Uh, it's interesting, you know, the business people like everyone else, you know, they, they like uh, fresh air, they like a safe community, they like to protect their property. And so if you can wedge these together, and the last one, of course, is the uh, social justice. Uh, uh, environmental justice. It is essential that we have a shared prosperity. And to the extent that you are excluding people or permitting people to be excluded, it's not only the moral issue of the shared prosperity, but you're losing customers, you're losing workers, you're, everything. You ought to be out there saying, I want everyone to prosper and come shop at my place. Uh, and that's part of our message. Hmm. It's uh... So just as a little bit about my background, I have a master's in 
forestry from Virginia Tech, and my particular research of all things was on Tea Party opposition to sustainable development, of which this this smart growth question was something that uh, unfortunately was was wrapped up in that that same conversation. And so the lens that we kind of took in, in that research was that this is a question between uh, individualism and, and collectivism, and that really the the bottom line behind all the conspiracy theory stuff that is, of course, problematic in much of its own way, is that there's a question of these mostly a lot of rural folks, but people everywhere that essentially don't want someone telling them what to do or don't want to think collectively about how to solve problems. And I'm wondering kind of how you guys go about uh, letting people know that they, you know, there are these issues require collective solutions in some ways. Uh, you're absolutely right about the the nature of the the opposition and uh, the focus, and it, it's uh, for many people very legitimate and fair about uh, why should you have any statement over use of my property, or why should you tell this little town which way to develop or to grow, uh, and uh, also in many cases even a con conspiracy theory, or at least a theory that uh, these are a bunch of tree huggers that want to come in and stop growth and prosperity. Uh, and uh, I think uh, for the most part, we're now long past this, this, what I used to call false dichotomy, that you're either for the environment or for the economy. Uh, and my argument, and I say this to my business friends and my green friends, uh, you must be for both. If we, if we succeed in one and not the other, uh, life is not going to be that good on this planet. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're trying very aggressively to bring that across. Uh, it, it is working in part uh, because people can now see uh, what, it work, what works. I mean, people look at Pittsburgh, which was a uh, city on the decline for decades, and it was regularly held up as a, as a basket case for development, and people were fleeing and everything else, using uh, their own unique strategy of focusing on, on sports and, and medical facilities and education facilities combined with a really aggressive uh, smart growth approach. Uh, Pittsburgh is now uh, one of the most prosperous, growing uh, mid-sized cities in the country. And we're seeing this just about every place. And so what I say even to small communities is your young people will be leaving. And you're not going to survive, uh, you know, decades from now unless you create a sense of place uh, where young people want to be. Uh, and when they come out of college, you really want them to say, "Hey, we want to come back and live here." Or uh, the seniors, uh, when when they thinking about where do they want to uh, age, increasingly. Uh, a large number of the baby boomers and all are saying, I want to age in place. It's no longer about everyone, massive uh, uh, trains to Florida or South Carolina or nursing homes or, or assisted living homes. Now it is about aging in place with the family. And civic leaders, political leaders here, that's not going to happen in your community. And so don't think about what I'm saying. Think about do you want your parents around here? Do you want your children around here? Uh, do you want that type of community? And when you start talking about that, this false uh, approach of saying, oh, it's about property rights, don't don't tell me what we do. And I tell people, we're not telling you what to do, we're telling you what's going on right now and where you're gonna be if you don't make some adjustments uh, in the direction of your policy. We'd like to take a moment now to say thank you to our sponsors today. The Urban Affairs and Planning Program at Virginia Tech School of Public and International Affairs offers an interdisciplinary approach to understanding planning and policy for mega regions, cities, suburbs, and rural regions in the U.S. and abroad. UAP faculty have expertise in urban planning, architecture, urban design, economics, geography, political science, law, technology, and engineering, and provide students with a multifaceted understanding of how communities grow and change. Students apply their knowledge and professional skills by participating in real-world problem-solving with community clients through project-based studios and applied research. UAP emphasizes technical analysis and policy evaluation in approaching the complexities of modern communities. So big thanks today to the Urban Affairs and Planning Program down at Virginia Tech for being our sponsor. If you'd like to hear more, check them out online. But without further ado, we'll get back to today's guests. Thank you. 
Well, you, you've talked a little bit about the role of states as, as perhaps incentivizing local governments to take action. I'm wondering kind of how you weigh these different levels of government should be involved in, at the state, the local, and even the federal level. Right. Well, as a practical matter, uh, there is no one answer to that. And the reason there's uh, no one answer is uh, in addition to political differences in ideology, uh, the, the legal constitutional framework is different in each state. And in some states, local governments are fairly tightly controlled. Um, not to get too uh, much into the weeds, but uh, like Virginia, for example, will deal with this rule, and almost everything of local has to be approved uh, by the state, the state legislature. In other states, um, in Maryland, uh, adjacent state to Virginia here, uh, would be an example. Uh, we are largely a home rule state, and so local governments can do just about anything they want. Uh, unless it is specifically prohibited. Now, with that, with that distinction, uh, your question immediately moves in two entirely different directions. Uh, what I have uh, observed is, if you can take the approach that says, regardless of who is making the actual uh, final decisions, the emphasis should be on the finances of, of things. How much does it cost? Brawl is an expensive waste. And in these days of tight budgets, whether it's a state decision or a local decision, shouldn't that be a, a major consideration? Uh, the, the second portion of it is in almost every state, uh, local governments turn to the state for all kinds of assistance. Uh, the obvious uh, roads and water and sewer and, and in many cases school construction and stuff like that. But people also forget the number of other programs in which there's uh, state aid going there. And many local governments uh, will receive a significant uh, 40, 50 percent of their budget from state aid. And so the question then becomes for a state person, uh, do you want to give this money uh, unrestricted from other considerations? And so if you're providing money that is actually, let's say, adding to sprawl, which is adding to your future costs for roads and for ambulances and for police protection, and all of a sudden there'll be enough people out there for demand for a new school and everything, do you think we should be doing this? And so I urge whichever level of government it is, whoever's making the decision, that just about every decision be should be looked through uh, the uh, lens of, of a prism. And the prism should be, have a basic question. Does this contribute to further sprawl uh, or does it contribute to reinvestment in existing communities? And if it is the latter, it ought to receive a higher priority. Uh, and uh, state after state now are doing that, and they're doing it in a variety of different ways. Um, one of the programs that we work with um, the, through the Governor's Institute is to work directly with governors all across the country. Uh, and um, I must emphasize, this is not just like the usual suspects of liberal Northeast uh, America or whatever, because for example, uh, we were working just last year uh, and there's still some additional work going on with the state of Utah. Uh, and Utah was trying to figure out how to have a walkability connection uh, from some high-tech development areas to their uh, regional transit line. Uh, and we came in and, you know, we talked about what walkability is. We did what we call a walk audit to go through and see why people are not walking. Uh, and the reason they weren't walking because there were no sidewalks and stuff like this. Uh, and so uh, we, we go there and in the state of uh, Virginia, uh, which is East Coast, but uh, historically uh, more conservative. Uh, and in Virginia, we sat down uh, with the uh, governor uh, and with his uh, Secretary of Transportation and others and said, when you're evaluating road projects, almost always the question is, what is the cost and how do we pay for it relative to other costs? But should there be other considerations? In other words, uh, you're not just building a road because what I call the squeaky wheel, some some uh, noisy group or powerful state senator said we need this road, but you're doing it because you're trying to advance certain things. So, for example, then does it have 
open access to jobs? Does it actually reduce or to maybe even encourage more congestion? Uh, does it have an impact in emissions reduction that will start to meet some of the adopted uh, state goals? Uh, does it recognize issues of equity so that one of the components is actually to bring people and jobs that need them together easier? And uh, Virginia adopted, I think, uh, eight uh, or nine additional standards. And so they then went back and looked. Every state has this. It's a long list of transportation projects, mostly road projects. They've been on there forever, two decades, and slowly they move up. And then eventually they become eligible for planning and environmental review. And then eventually, 20 years after they're proposed, someone starts construction on the road. Well, they went back and they looked at their entire capital roads project, and they were able to eliminate well over a billion dollars of expenditure that even though they were in the programs, didn't meet a lot of the other values that were there, and in some cases even uh, went in the opposite direction. Uh, and so what we are urging uh, state and local governments to do is to uh, think about investment issues beyond simply what it is uh, that you're trying to do in the face of it and say, yes, but what does it do for other aspects of our life? Uh, I'll give you one quick example. After we started uh, Smart Growth, after it became enunciated a couple of my state of the state messages and everything else and became the law, and after I went on for a, uh, with a modesty, but a really major reelection uh, in which my opponent, by the way, did say, hey, the state's too much involved in this stuff now and all. After all of that, um, the uh, University of Maryland had been proposing for a number of years a new campus in Western Maryland. Uh, and they came to me one day and they wanted to show me the site that they had selected. Uh, and so I went up there and I looked at it and it was a beautiful old uh, um, apple farm that was being actually donated by a farmer. Uh, and I said, well, this is fine, but we're out here outside of town and everything. How do people get here? And they said, oh, yes, we're going to need a new interchange off the road over here, or off of Route, for, route, uh, seven, no, 40, route 40, uh, and things of this type. And I said, so you mean every person coming here, every student, every faculty, every staff member is going to drive to this campus? And he said, yes. And I said, well, haven't you heard about Smart Growth? And the person who I had appointed as chair of the Board of Regents says, well, yes, but this is the university. You know, we're, we're quasi-independent on this. And I said, okay, okay, I got it. And I said, I'm the governor. No project gets approved unless it is in the budget, and I'm not putting this location in the budget. Uh, and they said, well, we'll think about it. Now, in the meantime, uh, the mayor of the town of uh, Hagerstown, adjacent uh, mid-sized community, uh, was reading about what was going on, gave me a call and said, listen, come downtown, I want to show you something. And they showed me this, this neighborhood where there were several large uh, 1930, 1950 department stores and all beautiful buildings, uh, but they were abandoned uh, and they, they proposed it there. We ended up doing exactly that. We switched the whole thing to Regents Committee and said, we thought this over, we'd like to be downtown. Uh, and the university now is opening, is opened in beautiful buildings, investment and in housing and retail and everything all around it. And over 6,000 people between students, faculty and staff and all now routinely go to what was a neglected and declining uh, section of Hagerstown and is now prospering uh, and all kinds of other uh, private investment coming. Those those are the decisions that I think um, uh, officials, no matter whether you're a board of regents or a governor or a mayor or whatever, you've got to look through this prism and say, what are we really doing by building a campus, for example, uh, out in the countryside? Uh, it may have been in a platonic uh, sitting under a tree and meditating, a uh, nice way to do it, but it certainly was not uh, the way to do it in terms of uh, promoting the revitalization of a wonderful old town like Harrystown. And I'll guarantee you, every state has those communities. Uh, Roanoke, where you are right now, has uh, some of the challenges. Uh, and at the same time, you also see some development continuing to be approved uh, 10 miles outside of Roanoke and, and uh, not being critical of the state because this is a pattern, but we are changing it and it's exciting. 
Well, as someone who lives in a strict Dillon's rule state, I can share that it's about the worst thing that I think I can imagine for our localities in some ways. But um, it, it makes it a lot really difficult to do some of these things. But I'm wondering kind of as you have been looking at all these different communities across the country, and I'm wondering what if if you are interested in interested in this in a community, what are some of the creative new tools that you have seen be effective or that are coming online that you think have great promise to, to really promote this idea? Sure. Um, f first of all, I emphasize to people, uh, there is no one answer. Uh, you can't take uh, a program or a approach and say, hey, here, plop this down and everything's going to be fine. Uh, but what you can do is say, what is your goal? Uh, and then what tools do we need to make that work? And we have a, a sort of a, a shopping basket that you can pull all different types of things out of it. Uh, one that uh, I love, for example, and, and, and in part because it's so visible and so clear, uh, is what we call Complete Streets. Uh, Complete Streets program uh, simply says that it would be the policy of that jurisdiction that the street is intended for everyone. It's intended for pedestrians, it's intended for bicycle, and it's intended for, intended for uh, automobiles. Now, what happens on this, and it's, it's very, very interesting, in many areas, there are no sidewalks, but if there are sidewalks, they're broken and uneven, or there are telephone poles and sign poles right in the middle of it, uh, and there's no landscaping, so if you're walking down the street, cars are going by, and there's rather odd patterns of, of uh, like uh, four or six lanes, uh, one direction, all going in, mostly designed to speed the uh, commuters trip in the morning and the evening and, and to reduce congestion. And I always tell uh, mayors and local officials, so your main transportation policy is to get people in and out of your city? Uh, and somehow or other, there was this assumption that they had to do that in order to have the businesses uh, locate down, downtown. And so on complete streets now, uh, what we recommend is the sidewalk should be wide enough that two couples walking past one another uh, could do so easily, that there should be some type of landscaping, that there should be encouragement for businesses, uh, and either requirement or encouragement, to build right up to the sidewalk. Uh, people don't like to walk along a bunch of parking lots or just uh, massive walls. Uh, that if you are building something, a uh, building, that the ground floor should be retail, uh, that there should be uh, opportunities for uh, cafes and other activities on the sidewalks, uh, and that there should be serious attention uh, to bicycle and bicycle uh, options, and reduce the number of lanes, but you can actually increase the traffic flow by careful uh, management of that process. In other words, put some landscape center strips and eliminate the number of crossovers and left turns and all of us and pull down the the, uh, the traffic lights and all of a sudden people start moving pay real attention to pedestrian crossings and pedestrian safety um, we are very fortunate now and that there's been uh, over uh, 1200 local governments have adopted the um, complete street policies uh, and uh, 33 states, either totally or state agencies, have adopted uh, complete street policies. And we're now moving to the process of implementation. Uh, we, we work directly with the local governments and they say, okay, we agree with this, this is great and all, but how do we do it? And it's actually fairly straightforward, fairly uh, simple. The most important thing is remember, this is not just about uh, the big cities that you see all of a sudden redeveloping and, and flourishing. It's not just about the, the Denvers and the Pittsburghs and the, even Philadelphia. I hate to word it that way, even, but even Philadelphia is making a, a significant comeback. Uh, but it's places like uh, Las Cruces, uh, New Mexico, or South Bend, Indiana, or Walsall, Missouri, or Baltimore, Maryland. All of them are doing uh, complete streets now. And you ride down the street and you see the difference. Uh, I, I remember uh, visiting uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and they had been studying for several years how to revitalize uh, an area where some big uh, former industries had left. Uh, and, I, uh, and they said, uh, this is our fifth uh, general plan looking at. And I told them, I said, you got to stop planning. Uh, you got to stop uh, studying and you have to do something for people to see the difference. 
they took the complete street option and uh, started widening one of the sidewalks. Interestingly, only on one side of the road to get something going. And they asked me to come back a couple of years later, and I did. And I, when I went back there, it was amazing. That was only about four blocks long, but there were people on the sidewalk. There was a cafe where they were sitting there having some coffee. Uh, there were new businesses moving in. Uh, this is what a complete street uh, tool can do. Uh, and it's very, very exciting to see. Other things include um, the ones, uh, tools that I like is uh, transit and transit oriented development. Uh, transit has become major all across the country. Uh, it is uh, sometimes uh, something like a uh, bus rapid transit system, where it's basically bus, but you have dedicated lanes. In Denver, for example, they're truly dedicated as if it were rail. Uh, no cars could go in there and so on. Uh, but uh, it, it has a predictability of every eight minutes or whatever it is, a bus is going to be there and you can get on it. Or um, you, you can look at places where uh, all of a sudden whole new uh, transit systems are being uh, adopted. Interestingly, notwithstanding the huge no new taxes under any circumstances. I don't care if the world's collapsing, I'm not going to vote for a tax approach that seems to dominate some of uh, national politics today. Uh, most of these jurisdictions have actually involved the voters going to a referendum and imposing an additional cost on themselves to support this new system. And curiously enough, these are not, again, the, the usual suspects, as I call them, in the Northeast. Uh, they, they are places uh, uh, like uh, uh, Charlottesville, North Carolina, uh, or, or like um, um, Little Rock, North Little Rock, Arkansas. I just voted to do this, and Kansas City and, and Cincinnati. Uh, uh, the one I thought was interesting uh, was that in uh, 2010, when the height of the Tea Party was, was blossomed, the voters in Houston voted to impose a increase in terms of their sales tax in order to support a regional uh, transit system. And so we're seeing transit and transit-oriented development. To make it work, by the way, we, we urge local governments to think about several things. Think about uh, you can reduce the cost for private investment and encourage it around a transit zone, transit-oriented development. And the easy way to do it is people walk half a mile with no great sense of, of, uh, of stress or looking for other ways of transit. So what you do then is you draw a circle basically of a mile around a transit station. And in that circle, you do things that really encourage investment in transit development. So. Most jurisdictions have a requirement for parking spaces. You have to have 2.4 on the average nationwide, 2.4 parking spaces per residential unit. Uh, well, you know, maybe if you're way out in the suburbs or something, but if you're within walking distance of a transit station and 70% of the stuff you do, you can walk to, why do you need the parking spaces? Uh, when you talk about 40 to $60,000 of space, you reduce the cost immensely. Then you say, Ground floor must be retail. Mixed use is not something you have to fight for and apply for. It's something we're encouraging you to do. And then where it starts getting interesting, but this is part of the debate going on across the country, uh, you, you start looking at something called value capture. And the value capture is if you own a piece of land, let's say 10 acres, and a new transit station is coming in, or some other major public investment that revitalize the area. But your land is, is worth maybe $250,000. We build a, a new transit station, we make this investment, we give you the additional density, we give you automatic mixed use, and all of a sudden your property is worth $25 million. Well, who benefits from the gain? And, and for most people, well, the property owner, obviously. But we, the public, pay for this to make it happen. And so what we are encouraging is in a variety of devices, you have some type of value capture uh, approach that puts a small additional fee uh, on the top to run and operate different things. The most common one uh, is for uh, parking uh, authorities, uh, whereby you say to the building, you don't have to worry about garages, no, we're going to build them, but we're also putting a uh, additional 3% on your property tax or whatever, and the value added, only the increased amount. 
uh, and so you still have the net win. Uh, and that's been done successfully in many, many communities. We are now looking at the issue, though, of housing affordability. What do you do with that $45,000 family that's working so hard and all of a sudden now uh, they, they can't rent or buy in that immediate area. And so with the value added uh, capture, you make sure that some of those units are bought down in terms of price for average working families to afford as well. So all of this stuff in terms of transit oriented development is working very, very well. There are other things like form based uh, uh, zoning, um, uh, built form based building codes. Uh, we have a, a significant effort uh, for creation of. Uh, arts uh, districts that are actually flourishing very, very well. Several communities in Pennsylvania are doing extraordinarily well with that. Um, small scale manufacturing occurring right in the town. You, you're walking down the street and there's a coffee shop, uh, and there's a little bookstore, and there's an entrance to the uh, ABC company. And you look at that, what the heck is that? And you go in, it's a small manufacturing, for example, of uh, medical devices, uh, maybe 50 employees. Uh, working on it there. And this is becoming uh, part of the new reality of the reindustrialization of our uh, long uh, standing cities that were built on the old industrial age. And so it's, all of these things are very exciting to see. Hmm. Well, you mentioned it. I'm assuming that uh, from a standpoint of when you go into a new community, you often see those physical built in environment things in terms of what do the streets look like what are, what shops are here what uh, what's happening here but i'm wondering kind of what are when you walk step off that plane in a new community for the first time are there things either psychologically or, or uh, governmentally or, or structurally or in the built environment that you look for let you know whether things are going well or not in that community uh, there are some definite signs about uh, uh, what's working and what's not and w where there are challenges. Um, uh, as I said before, so much of this is based on personal experience, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story about my uh, son, Raymond, uh, who is uh, now 38 and has his own business uh, here in the District of Columbia. But uh, several years ago, uh, when he was working for Ask Me for the Union, uh, he gave me a call one time and he, he said, Dad, have you ever been to Boise, Idaho? And at the time I had not, and I said, no. And he said, you know, this is really a neat community. He was there for a six week assignment. He said, this is really a neat community. I could see myself living here. Well, I want to tell you, when you get a 25 year old looking around at the place and say, this is cool, I could live here. Uh, what happens almost immediately is the big businesses uh, are uh, have done the research and they know to have, especially for the knowledge-based economy, the shiny brights coming out of college are no longer going to the office park out in the suburbs. No, they want the same thing my son saw. I might add as a, as a quick aside, it was kind of funny, my daughter is 15. A couple of years ago, uh, we were over in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, which is a major revitalization area and all. And she, she's looking around, she said, Dad, why don't we live here? Uh, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, already at 15, she's she's picked up the, now we live in Annapolis, by the way, and I told her, I said, Annapolis is a beautiful little place. Said, yeah, but this is really cool. Uh, so part of it is just, is there a sense of place? Is there some place that uh, the young people want to go? And if the young people want to go there, the businesses, and again, especially the knowledge-based businesses, will go there as well. And that's why we see major companies leaving the suburbs of Connecticut and moving to downtown Boston. Uh, that's why we see uh, places like Washington, D.C. just absolutely thriving. Uh, in fact, uh, I ask, when people talk about what's happening, I said, look at one clear indice. Measure the age of your population. Now, the whole nation is getting older, to be sure. But if your population is getting older, and, and particularly significantly older, uh, as opposed to a population where the average age is going down, uh, then you can see where the young people are going. And that will tell you where the businesses are going to go. And that will then tell you uh, where the other business activities move in to support it. Uh, and so uh, show me a community that has a significant increase on a regular basis of the aging population, and I'll show you a community that is in long-term difficulty. Now, I also must add, 
the image that comes to most people's mind is we're talking about large communities, large cities or something of this type, and everyone's flocking to the big cities these days. That's not uh, necessarily so. In Maryland, for example, there's a little town over in the eastern shore called Berlin, Maryland. And in Berlin, Maryland, it's only got several thousand people. The last uh, 10, 15 years, the age of this little rural community has been declining as young people are moving into it and they have built a whole economy on kind of a historic tourism uh, and neat little places. And so it's over, it's not on the beach, but it's on the way to the beach and, and they're absolutely flourishing. They have adopted these principles of walkability, of mixed use, of, of not being car oriented, uh, a smart group, uh, and they're flourishing, and you can go just a few miles and see similar communities, similar size, that are aging and aging, and the buildings are closing and, and, and neglected, and this is true all across America. Hmm. Well, I wonder if you could kind of close us out with a story of a community that's really embraced smart growth and how it has then impacted that community moving forward and how you've seen it, it change that, that place. <laughs> Well, let me give you one really dramatic uh, example, and then I could point to so many others where they're pulling down elevated highways and where they're, like in Buffalo, where they're now opening up the, the, the vista to the lakes and, and things, to the lake and things like this. But one that I saw just recently that really uh, struck me was uh, in New York City. Uh, there's a boulevard there, Queens Boulevard, uh, and on that boulevard, uh, from 1990 to 2014, there were 138 pedestrian deaths. In fact, it was known as the Boulevard of Death. Uh, imagine that, if you think about it, uh, 138 pedestrian deaths on one road uh, just in a 25-year period. If that had occurred as one incident, my people go, my God, what's going on here? We've got to fix this. Well. Uh, they came to the conclusion that uh, they needed a complete street on that. They needed to address these issues, and they did a variety of things. Uh, first of all, they immediately lowered the speed limit. Uh, they invested money in the redesign of the road. They put landscaping, bike lanes, uh, something that uh, sounds strange. They, they put really well-designated crosswalks. Uh, they put a middle safety area for uh, pedestrians uh, that uh, you know sometimes don't make it all the way across on a light. Uh, and uh, I think most importantly, they reduced the number of lanes. Uh, now, uh, since 1914, when they, when they started making all these changes, there has not been a single pedestrian death uh, on that same boulevard. Uh, and uh, Mayor de Blasio is now talking about being the boulevard of life. Uh, and as you know, he has this uh, zero uh, vision where they're going to bring the uh, pedestrian fatalities down to zero uh, citywide, and they are rapidly achieving exactly that. And, and I look at that, and I think of this, and I, and I say, and, and they're planning the next stage. They're going to take that same boulevard, they're going to add a, a number of trees and, and increase further the uh, a pedestrian area, make it a, a walk path as well, right in downtown New York. And so uh, they're actually creating almost a linear pedestrian area and having the traffic move through. And I look at that and I think, number one, this is great for the city. Uh, and, and number two, it's really a, a success for smart growth and for complete streets. But most importantly, what about those 138 people who, who were killed? Uh, in the past just because we had poor design of our roads. And, and this is absolutely showing. If you go four years and not one single fatality on the same uh, road where all these people were killed in the past, and uh, they are moving aggressively, and this we're seeing it's become a model, again, even for the smaller jurisdictions, uh, the same type of thing uh, moving in. So that's, that's one of the examples that I uh, take a great deal of uh, pride in because not just revitalization, not just aesthetics, not just environment, but in this case, actual life. Uh, and then that's an important consideration. Oh, that is uh, that's such a powerful story to, to kind of bring us all full circle there. And I'm wondering if, if people are interested in finding out more information about the work that you guys are doing at Smart Growth America or that you're, that you're doing, where can they find more information? Our, our website throws all of these programs together, uh, www.smartgrowthamerica.org. Uh, and, and also all of the studies we've done, all the detailed plans and everything are available to anyone, public uh, officials, business, uh, without cost. 
uh, and you can simply uh, pull them down. Uh, there is a place on there now because we are a nonprofit. If someone wanted to be supportive uh, and make a contribution, uh, they're most welcome. But, but more importantly, the biggest contribution as far as we're concerned are those people that look at our website, uh, adopt it, and start revitalizing the areas. Sprawl that would have consumed that forest right outside of town is now stopped, and lives are saved. Business starts to prosper. Uh, that's what it's really about, and that's our, our real reward. Wonderful. And if you guys are interested in learning more about CityWorks Expo, you can find us at cityworksxpo.com. Uh, but, Governor, thank you so much for time, taking the time today. Thank you, Brian. Once again, thank you for listening to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. We truly hope you've enjoyed today's episode and come away thinking more deeply about something than you were before. If you have, we'd appreciate a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you might be listening to this. It really helps other people find out about the podcast and the great guests that we have on. Further, I'd like to welcome all of you all to check us out on CityWorksXPO, that's CityWorksXPO.com, and learn about our annual gathering, CityWorks 8, where this year's theme is Anticipating 2050, Acting Today. We're really excited about what we have going on this year and some of the speakers that we have coming in, and we hope you'll join us in Roanoke, Virginia from October 4th through 6th and be part of what's really a very special event. But for now, thanks again for listening and have a great week.